professor is Dr. Kelly Birkenstock. Some of you may have watched her show. Uh, I guess it's in the morning, isn't it? It's usually on Fox 8 News. Oh, yeah. okay. I thought yeah. you were on WGSU. I used to be. Oh, now you're on Fox <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure speaking to you today. Again, I'm Dr. Kelly Birkenstock. I have offices in New Orleans and in Mandeville. I am a local native here and been practicing for 20 years. I do a lot of talks actually across the nation and occasionally I'm invited to be on WDSU, Fox 8, most recently Fox 8. Um, today, the hot topic is gardening as a form of exercise. There are many things that we know about gardening. There are many enjoyable things about gardening as a hobby and such, but you may or may not know that when you're gardening just in an average mode, you're burning 100 to 200 calories per hour. Now, if you increase that range of motion, so if you really do some exaggerated movements when you're doing that raking or lunging when you're doing that weeding or pruning, you can actually increase that to 500 calories per hour. That beats most of your gym activities. And think of the benefit. Gym membership, or if you're at home, buying gym equipment, all very expensive items. When you're outside in your natural landscape, all you need is a rake, a mower, hopefully a push, push mower, because that's a lot more exercise, a rake, some pruning tools, very, very inexpensive gym equipment for the natural outdoors. So when we talk about gardening as a form of exercise, we'll get into that in a moment, but not only are we exercising our body, we're also exercising our brain. So as we're looking around and planning what we're going to be doing next and what we're going to plant there or yonder, we're thinking, so we're developing brain power, and that's actually keeping our brain healthy and vi revitalized. It's actually proven that uh, elderly people, when they are incorporated into forms of gardening, whether it be at an assisted facility or in their own yard, they actually do better with depression, and it's been proven with scientific studies that it will delay the onset of dementia and Alzheimer's. So if somebody had the tendency where they were going to develop dementia or Alzheimer's, gardening is actually almost better than Prozac. So. It, it, it's a very, very good for the brain. Of course, when we're outside gardening, it is a form of meditation, so it's very calming and very relaxing. So let's switch over to the human body. So when we take it from the brain to the human body, what's going on? With all this vigorous exercise that we're doing, we are actually decreasing our risk for diabetes, blood pressure, heart disease, osteoporosis, lots of great things going on in the body while we're exercising in the garden. Uh, Oh, dementia, of course, which we mentioned before. So one of the things that you can do when you're gardening, instead of a simple little break, okay, of course, always remember to stretch first. Before any activity, stretch first. But when we begin raking, for example, you're going to want to do perhaps 15 strokes on the left. And then, this is something that not everybody thinks of, go ahead and do 15 strokes on the right. So regardless of what handed that you are, you want to remember to switch off because when you switch off, then you're exercising fairly all of the exercise groups. In the beginning, it may feel a little unusual using your non-dominant hand, but as time goes on, it becomes second nature. The other thing we want to bring up when we're gardening is you don't want to focus on one activity for that whole gardening period. For example, you'd want to uh, rake, for example, maybe 10 or 15 minutes doing the alternate method stroke, then you want to stop and perhaps go weed the garden for 15 minutes. One thing that's helpful, because people can get sort of over-focused on, I've got to get this whole garden weeded today, then they wake up with the sore muscles and they may pull their back or pinch a nerve or something. What's much better to do is get a rock or a glass or some other token where you can say, okay, I'm going to do six feet today. And you put your garden stone or your, your, your glass or something down and measure out what you're going to do for that day. Or you can set a timer. I'm going to set this timer for 15 minutes, then I'm going to stop weeding. That doesn't mean you have to stop all activities for the day, but you want to go on to something else, whether it's pruning, raking, mowing, etc. So you want to be flipping activities every 15 minutes. And after about an hour, you should call it quits. Always remember, use your sunscreen. And when you're using your sunscreen in the garden, it should always have zinc or titanium. 
There are a million and one brands when we look in the drugstores, and it can be very confusing. There's SPF 20, 30, 50, 100. Really, the FPFs don't count. If it doesn't have one of two ingredients in it, zinc or titanium, you're exposing yourself to, to skin cancer. Those are the only two ingredients that can actually block uh, skin, uh, skin cancers from the sun. There are plenty of ingredients, octreonide, and I could name them on and on and on, that will block redness, but they're not blocking skin cancer rays, okay? So those two items, zinc or titanium, are very, very important to protect ourselves. Of course, clothing with brimmed hats, long sleeve shirts, cotton that breathes are a another good thing to do when we're outside. Um, and then, of course, we want to switch activity. So maybe you want to do the raking for 10, 15 minutes. You want to do the weeding for 10, 15 minutes, the pruning for 10, 15 minutes. And you want to uh, switch off from heavy duties to lighter duties and heavy duties to lighter duties. When you're digging, please make sure that you don't dig, twist, and throw. Dig, twist, and throw. When you're digging or shoveling and you come up with that shovel, you want to step over and place it where you're going to place it. That twisting can really cause a lot of damage to that lower back. So we want our strong muscle groups to work for us. When we're gardening, we can actually, and most of the time do, use all major muscle groups, from the legs, to the arms, to the back, to the neck, to the stomach. So you're really getting an overall workout and paying a heck of a lot less money than a professional trainer at a gym. Um, when we exercise in gardening, one of the most beautiful things about that, in addition to just calories and weight loss, is we're, we're doing four important forms of exercise, strength, endurance, balance, and flexibility. And we all worry about, as we get into our older, more mature years, about balance and falling and breaking hips. That's one of the most beautiful things about gardening, is there's hardly any other activities that, that you can get all four of those groups, the endurance, the balance, the strength, and the flexibility. So it's just a wonderful form of exercise. And I think it doesn't get enough credit. When we look around at our, our young people in the schools today, we're seeing the highest rates of obesity than we've seen in two generations. Why? They're not going outside. Doesn't mean they have to garden. That's one great thing to do when they're outside. But even if it's riding their bikes or taking walks or so, so on and so forth, most of the time they're sitting inside playing on the Nintendos and Playstations and TVs and all this other computers when they should be outside. So we're seeing an overwhelming rate of obesity. So if you've got children or grandchildren, let them come outside with you and join in the fun. Um, that's really about all that we have to talk about on exercise and gardening, the main focal points. I'll open up now for questions. Yes? How about gardening in August? Ah, you'd, wanna, you'd certainly want to pick the early morning hours, uh, you know, before 10 a.m., and then close it out. Thank goodness we're in daylight saving times way in the, the late hours, say 7 to 9 or, or 6 to 8 or something like that. No, you don't want to be out in the major heat of the day because then you risk overheating, heat stroke, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And then drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't drink Gatorade. That, that absolutely is asking for trouble in terms of uh, blood pressure, kidneys, kidney disease and such. Plain old-fashioned fruit juice is usually plenty enough to replace your electrolytes. Gatorade has got Gatorade was built or made for NFL players when they where they lose exorbitant amounts of salt and potassium and magnesium in one session. None of us are NFL players. I don't think we have any in the audience tonight. Therefore, that kind of overload of electrolytes is putting intense pressure on your kidneys, heart, and your pancreas to digest all that heavy amounts of sugar. It's a bad habit. I have spoken to schools all over, and I recommend that they take those machines out of the, of the school lunchrooms where they can just push a button and get a can of Gatorade. It's, it's a horrible idea. Yeah. Yes? What about the water that says electrolytes? You know, some of those are good, but a lot of those are misrepresented on the bottle. So, I, you know, I don't trust those factors very well. So I brought up my kids and, and myself. When I'm outside sweating or doing a lot of work, whether it's jogging, gardening, or whatever, um, you know, orange juice, apple juice, mango, whatever. If you're diabetic, of course, different story. But um, if you're not, yeah, yeah. But plain water won't, won't put the electrolytes back in, so that's where we have to be careful. But there are many great uh, supplements that have 
chelated calcium, magnesium, zinc, and potassium, and then you know you're not going to overload yourself with sugars and salts. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, coconut water, you know, things come and go. It was aloe vera for a while, now it's coconut water. As long as you read the ingredients and there's not a lot of added sugars and salts, I think it's fine. And it's quite tasty. Yeah. What about Pedialyte? Pedialyte is a step better than Gatorade, but I still, I still think it's an overload that we don't need. Pedialyte was built for when, when, you're, when the babies are so small or the little kids and they can actually get into a dehydration phase so quickly because their body mass is so small. So if they are up chucking and have a high fever, they can burn through their electrolytes so fast and then they can't replace them fast enough and then you wind up with a trip to the hospital for dehydration. So, you know, Pedialyte certainly is better than Gatorade. Um, but again, I, I would focus on natural stuff first. Yeah. What do you think of Red Bull? Oh, yeah. it's horrible. It's poison in a can. It's absolute poison in a can. Any of those. I can't think of the other one. Red Bull. There's a couple of other. Monster, Red Bull. They've got hidden forms of stimulants in them, and they're very, very dangerous. I will tell you, uh, when I was at charity 20 years ago, we, we would see heart attacks in 26-year-olds. And what they were, had done, they had, whether it's, it uh, doesn't matter the brand, I'm not picking on any brand, they're all awful in, in my opinion, whether it's the bull or the monster, or whatever, and they would mix that with vodka or gin, and, and their heart would get so confused. They could have a heart attack or go into atrial fibrillation very easily, even at a young age. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know. They, the kids love all that junk, but it's, it's not a friend. It's, it's definitely an enemy. Yeah. You know, that's a great point, and I'll tell you, some of my colleagues and I argue about this. Mm -hmm. Just as recently as in the last six months, do you remember hearing on the news, don't go outside today because of the ozone layer, the ozone layer has a problem today? And then years ago, they took antiperspirants and deodorants off the market, the spray ones, because it was ruining the ozone layer. It, it, you may or may not have heard about that. Of course, it catches my ear because I'm in the medical industry. So the ozone layer, at least for the last 30, 35 years, has been busted, the natural ozone layer, so that bad cancerous x-rays and radiation particles are getting through it and are getting into the human race. The good vitamin D, by and large, is very little to almost all gone. There was a study done in Hawaii, and they had young ladies outside for 24 hours in bikinis, and they picked up the equivalent of 15 minutes of vitamin D. If you took it back in time, I forget the exact ratio, maybe it was 50 or 60 years. So in other words, what you would get from the sun in 15 minutes before the ozone layer and the radiation and the x-rays and gamma rays started to come through before, take it back to present time, you're only getting 15 minutes of, of what you used to get, excuse me, in 24 hours, you're only getting an equivalent of what you used to get in 15 minutes. So my suggestion is get vitamin D from your mushrooms, from your fortified milk, and from a good vitamin D supplement. And the vitamin D drops are the best because they're so easily absorbable. So even, even three to five minutes? Well, I mean, you could. You could. But you, you, you can't take the good without the bad, you know. And then a sunscreen is going to block everything. But there's not much vitamin D to get currently, present day, unless something significantly changes with the uh, environment. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Y'all have been such a wonderful, receptive audience. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, John.